Hey everybody, welcome to video 5-2. We're going to be starting here on page 233 with explain 1. And in this video we're going to be talking about the angle side angle triangle congruence shortcut. Now if we have watched this video after you've been playing the game that we played in class, then you understand that even though in video 5-1 we talked about every time triangles are congruent, there are six embedded congruences that we have to check, meaning all three sides corresponding pairs and all three angles corresponding pairs. Well, that was true, but actually it's um, a few different shortcuts that can prove it faster. So if we know certain combinations of sides and angles um, are corresponding pairs of those are congruent, then we don't have to go through all six to verify it. We can just use sometimes three and sometimes even as few as two under certain conditions. So this is the first one of our triangle congruence um, theorems. And you can see here at the top of page 233, we're talking about if two angles and the included side of one triangle are congruent to two angles and the included side of another triangle, then the triangles are congruent. Now, let's just pause for a second and talk about this word, the included side. Um, it's important that you understand the location of an included side is that an included side is between the other two angles. And it's really easy to remember that because when you write the ASA, or angle side angle triangle congruence theorem, you can notice that the S is actually right in the middle of the A's, just like in the location on the triangle, it's the side that the two angles share in common, okay? So in example one, we're being asked to determine whether the triangles are congruent. Since we're in our ASA section here in 5-2, Hopefully you can understand that that's what we're going to be searching for. So first off, um, if we look at the diagram here for triangle ABC and triangle DEF, we can see that we have a side, and on this left-hand triangle it is included between two angles, meaning angle A has sides BA and AC, and angle C has sides BC and AC as well. So this side that's shared between the two angles is what we call the included side. Now that's 2.3 centimeters and we've got another 2.3 centimeter side over here but notice the location of the angles in the diagram is not including that side. So what we would like to probably figure out is what is the measure of that angle D there because if we can show that somehow it's congruent to other corresponding angle, angle A, then we can prove that the triangles are congruent. So let's do our triangle sum theorem. You can see here D plus E plus F equals 180. Substitute what you know, E is 74, F is 61, and then do a quick sub uh, addition of 135 and subtraction, and that we get, finally, that measure of angle D is 45. So let's go ahead and write that on the diagram. We just found D was 45 degrees. Well, what that means, you guys, is as we're looking at corresponding angle measures and corresponding side measures, right now, we've got now angle A and D are congruent, angle C and F are congruent, and the included sides AC and DF are also congruent. So these two triangles are now congruent by the angle side angle triangle congruence theorem. In part B of example one, we're given two new triangles, JKL and MNP, and let's see what we need to figure out here. If we have J, angle J, and L that are including a 62 inch side, and we have another 62 inch side, then it looks like our missing angle is angle P. So our triangle congruence, uh, excuse me, our triangle sum theorem says that M plus N plus P's angle measures have to equal 180. M we know is 31 degrees and N is 38 degrees. 
So when we add those together, we get 69 degrees plus measure of angle P has to equal 180, and a subtraction there says that equals the measure of angle P equals 111 degrees. So the problem is that none of the angle measures in triangle MNP are going to correspond because if this is 111, even though we had, oops, got another digit there, even though we had 31 at one end of the triangle here and 62 in common, that third um, part of angle side angle, that other pair of angles, that fails. So as far as what we need to circle in the box here, um, since measure, none of the angles in triangle MNP has a measure of 110 degrees, because remember, that was the angle we were looking for it to be, and P is not the same as angle L. So therefore, what we're going to circle is there is not a sequence of rigid motions that maps triangle MNP onto JKL, and therefore MNP is not congruent to triangle JKL. Notice, the minute that we find a non-congruence between corresponding pieces, then that means that we can stop trying to find the rest of the six, you guys. Once one fails, the rest of them fail, and therefore um, the triangles are not congruent, okay? Okay guys, as we move on to the next part of this video, we're going to explain two, and we're going to be talking about proving that triangles are congruent using the angle side angle congruence theorem, okay? Um, so anytime we're using a proof, uh, remember that we're talking about a two column format here, so we've got our statements and our reasons, left and right columns. Um, what I would just like you to think about as far as a structure goes, remember, for two column proofs, is that whatever we are given is going to be the first couple statements, and then what we're being asked to prove is uh, always the last statement. Generally, the structure for a triangle congruence proof is that the first few lines of the congruence proof before we prove that the triangles are congruent are basically going to be the parts of, in this case, angle side angle, whichever shortcut it is that we are looking at when we look at the diagrams and the markings that we come up with. Um, we want to make sure that the parts of the triangle congruence theorem that we're using to prove the triangles are congruent is actually all broken out piece by piece. So let's take a look at the givens here. We are given that angle MQP is congruent to NPQ. So let's mark those. MQP is here, is congruent to NPQ is here. We're also given that MPQ on this side is congruent to NQP over on this side. And even though it's not marked, you guys, we can always mark that this shared side is congruent between the two triangles because, of course, whatever the length is in one is the same as the length in the other. So when we put that into a proof, we first off have the two given statements. So just state them as it's written and then put in given as your reason. And then the third piece that we need, if we're looking over here, as we move around the triangle, we have an angle, a side, and an angle, and an angle-side angle corresponding sides and angle pairs there. 
So we, if we know we're going to use the angle side angle triangle congruence theorem, then, then all we really have to do is write ASA as our reason. All right, let's go to the next page. Coming up is page 235. And at the top of page 235, we have that given angle A is congruent to angle C. Let's mark as we go here on our diagram. And given that E is the midpoint of segment AC, so let's highlight that segment AC is right here. If E is in the middle, then remember what that means is that we can mark congruent parts on either side of the midpoint. And then what we're being asked to prove is somehow that the triangles are congruent. So I don't know about you, but I'm in the ASA section here in 5-2. And right now, I only see an angle and a side in each triangle that I have marked. So there must be a hidden angle missing somewhere. Well, I'm going to zoom in for a second. You guys, if we zoom in on this picture, I hope you can see that we've got a missing vertical angle pair that we've not yet marked that is going to give us that third letter in our ASA congruence. And that's angle AEB and angle DEC. Okay. So now that we have all the parts marked in our diagram, let's go ahead and fill in the proof. And this should be pretty straightforward. Why do we know that angle A is congruent to angle C? We just have to fill in the reasons here. Well, that's a given. Why do we know that E is the midpoint of AC? That's also a given. Why do we know that segment AE is congruent to segment CE? Well, you guys, we were told that E is the midpoint, so that's just a simple, quick definition of the midpoint. And we've used that definition in proofs before, so I hope that's ringing a bell for you. Why is it that we're allowed to say that angle AEB, and again, that's this one, is congruent to angle CED? Why is that? Because those are vertical angles. So this is my vertical angles theorem. You can abbreviate that if you want to, VAT, that's fine with me. So let's just keep track of if we've got all three letters here. Angle A is congruent to angle C, that's my A of ASA. E is the midpoint, leads me to statement 3, which says that AE is congruent to CE. There's my side. And I've got my AEB is congruent to angle CED. There's my angle. So I've got all the parts of my triangle congruence theorem. And, and I can finish off my proof by saying, yes, the triangles are congruent by the ASA theorem. Moving down the page to number eight, your turn, you guys. See what you can do with this proof, number eight. Um, I would suggest that you might think about redrawing the separated triangles. So in other words, take them from not overlapping anymore. So you've got JLM going this way and KML coming this way and see what you can do with markings when they're separated. J, L, M, and K, L, M. I think that'll help you as you fill in your statements and your reasons. See what you can do and we'll see you guys next time.